Coming up on TechZilla, really, it's not an internet kill switch? Please, re-elect us. Android 3.0, the daily 54 new planets. A dog pile, your GPU questions, Lloyd's got answers, HD Nation talks upgrades and color wheels, and a great way to use KeePass. So trot across the street to Mr. and Mrs. Miscellaneous and grab yourself a root beer float, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by GoDaddy. Gamefly. Go to Gamefly.com slash TechZilla for your free trial membership. And Jack Threads. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to TechZilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best leather belt made west of the Mississippi... Langless leathers! Uh, hey, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. <laughs> I, that's where I got my new belt from oh, when I was up awesome. in Portland. They're awesome. In any case, clearly, huge, amazing amounts of news came out the day we shot last week. Uh, first up, I am static electricity boy, and I can power small communities, possibly Chicago, by merely walking across the floor. Egypt, in bigger news, came back online and has the internet. Well, in, in, after five days, they've turned the internet back on in Egypt. That that. That's wrong. Should never cut the internet for any reason <laughs> whatsoever, which, my humble opinion. But meanwhile, Senators Lieberman, Collins, and Carper are claiming their, quote, protecting cyberspace as a national asset act is not a kill switch, but a tool to, quote, protect the U.S. from external cyber attacks. And that they'll be able to update it to contain, quote, explicit language prohibiting the president from doing what President Mubarak did. Yeah, well, it'll... Be, I, it'll be explicit interesting. language. Ex How about explicit language that says we will never shut it off, no matter what, and we will fortify it in such a way that it can never be turned off. But what, what if it's for the children? Isn't it for free? It's for everybody. <laughs> no, it, it, it's I, gonna, I'm clearly wrong. It's going to be interesting to see what S3480 morphs into, since I'm not entirely sure how language in the bill, which allows the president to declare a national cyber emergency and take control over privately owned networks, if they're critical infrastructure, as determined by the president and his crew, uh, the decisions shall not be subject to judicial review. It is ultimate power in the hands of the president, which I don't care who the president no. is, freaks me out. I, look, yeah. I, I, and No the, review. <laughs> the president's job's getting better and better, man. There's well, some great, the, great rules there. I mean, to the credits of the senators, they're like, we need to have a plan in place against, in case somebody attacks the United States cyber infrastructure because Americans need to shop online, right? I mean, I, I joke, right? But basically, it's, yeah, you're like, whatever, dude. No, that, uh, it, it's serious. It, it is, and it is very serious. It's disconcerting, and I, I hate that this is even a question, so. Well, call, call your Congress critter and express your opinion. That's the best thing you can do. Yeah, or so write them. Uh, Declan McCullen, by the way, has some really good analysis and history of what's going on with this and, and why, uh, why they're discussing this in the, in the Privacy Inc. blog. It's worth your time to read that one. Cool. In other news, Android got its market, or I should say the Android market now has a website. So you can get your app shopping on somewhere other than your Android device. Yay! Yay. Google also announced Android 3.0, a.k.a. Honeycomb, a.k.a. the version of Android, quote, specifically optimized for devices with larger screen sizes, particularly tablets. Honeycomb features the new holographic UI design, content-focused interaction, home screen customization, the ability to directly download photos from USB cameras, USB keyboards, and a really interesting camera application with the ability to control exposure, focus, flash, zoom, and more if the hardware is there. And also pretty much ignores phones. Yeah, it's basically, this is a tablet operating system, not a phone operating system. I'm digging it, man. It's, but people are like, can I get this on my phone? No. Or, or it could be also an inexpensive way to put good software in a TV, multimedia quality software in a TV. So I think they're kind of... Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Rupert Murdoch announced the Daily last week, the industry's first daily national news publication created from scratch for the iPad and other tablet devices. Big bet by the man. We're talking about 30 million. The rumor is 30 million they spent developing this. It's, we're talking about a pretty serious experiment. This is something 
targeted towards the iPad and, of course, the giant pile of Android and Windows 7 tablets that are coming out. Every day, 365 days a year, over 100 pages of original news, life, entertainment, opinion, and sports. And it's not just that. They're claiming they're going to have video content, 360-degree photos you can explore by swiping, interactive charts, infographics, and clickable hot spots. The option to save articles to read later, in-app comments, including audio comments, which scares me, and, of course, your local weather, your favorite sports team scores, news and feeds, crosswords, and Sudoku puzzles. Yeah. 40 bucks for a 365-day subscription. Much like Jesus Diaz over at Gizmodo, I gotta say, pushing 100 pages a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year would be very impressive. Oofa. It's a yeah. lot. Is also, it? Yeah, because this is also Rupert who's just like, it's, you know, I think it's a great time to sell MySpace because I'm moving on to the daily. I need more money. There you go. <laughs> hey, NASA announced that this week the Kepler Space Telescope found, get this, 1,235 planets in four months. That's Dang. pretty cool. Popularmechanics.com has a great interview with William Borucki. God, I hope I'm saying that right. Borucki? Uh, Borucki? Borucki. There we go. Who <laughs> talks about the findings, including, quote, 54 candidates in the habitable zone of their stars. It means basically you might be able to live on the darn thing if you can get there. If you want to find out why Kepler has the most boring mission ever launched and why that's so cool, check the link in the show notes. It's pretty crazy. I am, I'm excited. The James Keck telescope that's going to be going yeah. up uh, hopefully in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. Combine that with what they're doing with Chandra, the X-ray telescope, and, and this announcement. And Doo -doo. It's a golden age of astronomy. Oh, wait, I can't awesome. hum that or Paramount will sue us. <laughs> We've gotten quite a few questions in the wake of Mosey's changes. The super simple offsite backup tool has dropped its unlimited backup for five bucks plan. Mosey's new plan is 50 gigabytes on one computer for six bucks a month, 125 gigabytes a month for up to three computers for $9.99 a month. If you're currently an unlimited subscriber, good news, you've got basically unlimited backup through your last payment term. Hopefully, last time you paid it was for a year and not for a month. As you can guess, the questions have mostly been, where should I go? I gotta recommend Lifehacker's, quote, the best, most affordable alternatives to Mosey for unlimited backups. Their top Mosey alternative is Backblaze. I've heard that name a lot lately. Five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year for unlimited backup for one machine, no caps, no throttles, and they claim that they're in this for the long haul and could make the business pay. So Mosey, it's kind of funny, right? Because I've been reading about this. Mosey basically is like, most people didn't back up that much stuff, but there were some bad apples that were ruining our unlimited online backup business model. Um, I think it's more likely Robin Harris over at ZDNet Storage Bits, uh, he has what I think is probably a more accurate interpretation. And Mosey's new plan, pay more, get less, is that Mosey was bought by EMC a uh, while back. EMC is business to business and enterprise level Basically, they do crazy backup for people who have serious backup problems. Not like like I lost my photos, but but no. I have eighty thousand computers in four continents. How do I get all of this stuff backed up? Every my corporate day? email system is being backed up on your system. Uh, make sure my data stays there. Yeah, and EMC as a as an enterprise level company that usually works business to business is not used to consumer margins. They're used to like sixty percent margins. Consumer companies tend to operate at much lower profit levels. As a matter of fact, probably the most profitable company out there, Apple. Based barely hits 40% profit levels. So a lot of people are saying, basically, EMC's management was like, Mosey, this is cute. Make some real money. There you go. You know, and EMC is a huge company. Um, so Backblaze, I'm also a big Carbonite fan, though I've heard from folks that didn't find their customer service as wonderful as Mosey's has been. There are lots more options in that Lifehacker article. We've got a link to it in the show notes. Please check it out. And please, back up your system Do it. today. Do it. Do it. Do it locally and then also try to do it off site. At the very least, back up to a hard drive in exchange with a friend who doesn't live sort of on the same block geographic region likely to be burned down or, or tornadoed or. Do what flooded. that man says, but <laughs> make a separate copy of your data and put it somewhere safe. Coming up next on HD Nation, when you shouldn't upgrade your HDTV in color, it's not what you thought it was. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Gamefly. Gamefly is the largest online video game rental service and offers you a choice of over 7,000 new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds. With plans starting at $15.95 a month, Gamefly members can rent one to four games at a time and keep them for as long as they like. There are no late fees, no due dates, and shipping is always free. Once you're done playing a game, send it back and Gamefly will send you the next available game on your list. If you really like the game you're playing, simply click Keep It on the Gamefly website and the game is yours at a discounted price. 
Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. Techzilla fans get a 15-day free trial when they go to www.gamefly.com slash techzilla. It's time to get our HD Nation on. Matt in LA is looking for a bigger HD TV. He says, I'm thinking about upgrading my 42-inch Westinghouse 1080p LCD to a 50-inch LG 720p plasma. It sells for 600 bucks. I'm looking for the most bang for the buck. What do you think? Well, I notice a difference in size, resolution, color, reflection. Windows and excess light are not a problem for me. Lastly, does the 24p real cinema functionality make a noticeable difference? I can't stand the 120 hertz motion stuff. I feel your pain. Does your TV and Blu-ray player have to be set to 24p? Does the 24p real cinema work with the Apple TV? Thanks, Matt in LA. Uh, let's take it from the top. Uh, I'd say you're considering a larger screen size with fewer pixels over what you currently have. I really, it's hard for me to recommend that upgrade path, really. I'd say go 1080p or save your money until you can afford at least a 1080p screen because you're increasing that screen size without right. increasing the effective resolution. You're basically going to create a softer picture. Yeah, if you're like, I own a bar, there's a television above the bar, 40 feet away from anybody, 20 yeah. feet away from anybody, yeah, 720p is fine. If you're in the living room and you're like less than 12 feet away from your HDTV, you will, you will feel pain going yeah. from 1080p to 720p. And maybe, I, I've been checking plasma prices lately, and maybe it'll cost you another $100. So it's, there's no, uh, I will never recommend a 720p plasma at this point in my time. Also keep in mind that compared to your LCD, mm -hmm. you're going to be consuming more electricity, especially if you try to drive that panel in any kind of bright mode, like Vivid right. or so. So be careful about that. So 24 frames per second versus the 120 hertz, I can make anything look like a cheap wedding video from 1980. And do I have to set my Blu-ray player to 24 frames per second? Uh, you do, if you're going to have support for 24p, you have to be able to put in a 24 hertz signal into mm -hmm. this TV, which most Blu-ray players nowadays will do. So yes, you have to configure the Blu-ray player to do that. Right. And it will switch back automatically to 60 hertz output with the content that's not 24p native. Right. So that's good. Also with the TV, yes, I feel that 24p mode is a good thing. That will prevent that smoothing mode when you enable the 24p mode on the TV <laughs> compared to say the 120 hertz right. mode with a if it's left by default, it will add those interpolated frames, which creates that smoothing effect, which most people despise, including, including myself. It really makes film not look like film. Right. Even though technically it may be a superior way of displaying film, it's just very disconcerting, not because it's not accurate. But oh, it isn't it's, accurate. Well, it's not accurate compared to a... It's you taking know, the look a, away a from it. Yeah. It's a look. It's a, yeah. You know what? I hate, uh, yeah, I hate the smooth stuff. I, I dig it, especially on plasma. So just make sure that you've got the player, the player set up to output 24p. Mm -hmm. And then the TV, once, that, once it's receiving that signal, it'll give you that option then to enable or disable that mode. And take a look at it both ways. That particular function, that 24p mode in most TVs, it's getting better over time. So I've noticed that the latest TVs do it a lot better than even a couple years ago. It's also, it's, it's not unusual for the sort of the newer the Blu-ray, the newer the Blu-ray player is, the more likely the Blu-ray player will automatically automatically, if you, you let it auto decide the output format, it'll automatically do 24p for movies and, you know, the regular 1080p, 60 hertz, totally. and everything else. Hey, this week I came across a fascinating article about human vision, color vision really, and why traditional color wheels that we use in selecting colors or just looking at how colors blend are considered wrong. Now, I saw this on a uh, website called blog.asmartbear.com slash colorwheels.html. Now, the article's gist was really describing the differences of mixing colors when it comes to light versus pigments, like inks right. and dyes. Well, it's kind of funny because it starts out like, everybody learns in art class, red, assuming you still have art class, red, yellow, and blue. These are the primary colors. Red, and green, and blue. Red, green, and blue? Yeah. Well, uh, at least for for the primary colors, See, for and we've additive already, color. We've already sort of gotten to the gist of the article point, which is that there are a lot of different ways to define color, and most of us learn the wrong way, and there's a difference between pigment colors, which are stuff you mix on a paper, versus light colors, which is like looking at a television or a totally. projector. Totally. And then and the crux of it really is that with, with light, it's an additive process, where say you have a, red, a flashlight that puts out red and a flashlight that puts out blue. If you cross those beams, you'll get magenta or purplish right. color right in the middle. And the same with like a yellow light or a red light and a green light, you get like a yellow mm -hmm. where those two overlap. But with print, it's different. It's actually a subtractive system that takes those second, what are considered secondary colors, your, your red or your yellow, magenta, and cyan, and will basically blend those instead to basically absorb the wavelengths you want, like, and then only reflect the light you're trying to achieve. It's, it's a totally different process. So if you ever open up your, your ink printer, your inkjet printer, right. you'll usually see... CMYK. Yeah, uh, basically, the, the, the secondary colors plus a black channel, because that's the one thing you really can't do well with most like inkjet systems right. is create black. 
it comes down to also, once you get over that, that additive versus subtractive color systems and the difference between print and displays or light technology, it's also the brain's own color filters and how that ties into the concept of color opposites. Namely, that red and green are considered what are called color opposites and blue and yellow are considered color opposites. They don't really mix. Mm -hmm. If you have, say, red on the screen at 100% and you add 25% green to it, you don't suddenly get a reddish green. You actually subtract out 25% of that red instead of it appearing at you 100%. You get a duller red. Yeah. So, no, so, a uh, less bright red. Exactly. And that is really kind of interesting. It has to do with basically a pre-processing system in the human brain that says, you know what, when I'm receiving of this particular wavelength and this particular wavelength, here's how these two are going to interact based on the filters of the brain and how we end up perceiving it. Hmm. And this whole thing about the color opposites determines how it is that we actually perceive the color magenta because if you look at a spectral graph and see where magenta lies, it's like, oh, or, or a spectrum of, of all visible color, you'll notice that magenta is not on there anywhere. It's one of those colors that's totally made up in your brain and how that occurs. And this article just really kind of put it together. And in a sense, it got me considering, is, is yellow really truly the fourth primary color? And what does that say about Sharp's Quatron technology too and adding that fourth colored pixel? It, it really got me thinking, and it was a really well done article in terms of maybe we should have a color wheel with four primaries, having blue and yellow at opposites mm -hmm. and red and green at opposites, and then the blending around that way. And it, it kind of makes sense on a lot of levels. And I just recommend you take a look at it. It, it was just utterly fascinating to me. And if you're, a, if you're a display and or print geek, I think you get something out of it. And off to the new Blu-ray releases. Let's do it. Hey, it's now time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of February 8, 2011. First up, it's kind of a funny story. An adaptation of Ned Vizzini's novel of the same name, It's Kind of a Funny Story, follows Craig Gilner, a suicidal 16-year-old who checks himself into a mental hospital. During his stay, Craig meets a diverse set of characters, including his inpatient mentor, Bobby, played by the funny man, Zach Galifianakis. As with most Blu-ray releases of recent films, the transfer is of high quality, with the feature having plenty of room thanks to the 50 gigabyte disc. So expect clean 1080p VC1 video and clear DTS HD master audio. The extras are average, with commentary tracks, deleted scenes, outtakes, a making of mini documentary, and trailers rounding out this single disc package. Next up, Thelma and Louise, the 20th anniversary edition. This 1991 film was directed by Ridley Scott and stars Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis and features Brad Pitt in his first major film role. It tells the story of two best friends who embark on a vacation that quickly turns into something more dramatic and ends with an iconic ending scene that has been referenced and recreated many times over. Shipping on a single Blu-ray disc, the film sports a 1080p transfer of the original 239 to 1 feature. Extras include deleted and extended scenes, including an extended ending which includes commentary by the director. You'll also get documentaries and featurettes, a music video by Glenn Frey, and multi-angled storyboards of that final chase scene. Also released this week, Uncle Buck. This is one of John Hughes' 80s classics, this time with John Candy in the title role as a bachelor uncle who steps in to babysit his nieces and nephews, including Macaulay Culkin, and of course, hilarity ensues. The picture is a 1080p transfer of the original 185 to 1 feature, and the sound will be encoded in DTS HD Master Audio. Unfortunately, extras on this single disc offering are sparse, listing only production notes and quote, cast and filmmakers. But in exchange, this release is very affordable with an MSRP of $14.99 and Amazon listing it for only $10.99. Other releases include Criterion Collection's Amarcord, Barbed Wire, Beauty in the Briefcase, Discover Planet Ocean, 1987's Five Corners, 1996's Flipper, For Colored Girls, 1978's I Spit on Your Grave, 2010's I Spit on Your Grave, Legends of the Fall, Life as We Know It as both a single disc or a DVD digital copy combo, 2009's Middlemen, 2010's My Soul to Take, Ocean Odyssey, The Blue Realm, Ongbok 3, either on its own or as a digital copy combo, Paranormal Activity 2, 1984's A Private Function, Repo Chick, the River Wild, The Criterion Collection's Still Walking, Tamara Drew, Waist Deep, Wild Target, and you again. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoDaddy. GoDaddy.com makes it easy to customize your own virtual dedicated server. Choose one of three popular plans or select your own Linux or Windows servers with all the plan options you need. And remember, you can download GoDaddy's free iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry app to order right from your phone, manage your current domains, and more. 
Want a discount? Just use the code TECH9 to get $5 off, $30 or more. And be sure to check out revision3.com slash GoDaddy for a list of all the amazing GoDaddy deals from Revision 3. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Microsoft Security Essentials. If you're looking for a thorough, free antivirus and anti-malware program, look no further than Microsoft Security Essentials. It provides real-time protection, meaning that it'll warn you if that program you're trying to install isn't as innocent as it looks. And it automatically downloads updates so you're always on the ball when it comes to the latest threat. You can schedule a system-wide scan on whatever time frame you like, and even specify the maximum amount of CPU usage it can use. You can even scan removable drives, and if you're sure you know what you're doing, you can even exclude specific files, file types, or processes from the scan. So if you're surfing the net without any protection, stop it. Grab Microsoft Security Essentials and rest easy. Lloyd Case is back. No new GPUs this time. Instead, he's answered a dog pile of your graphics questions. All right, let's fire up a question we get a lot. What's the cheapest PCI Express GPU you recommend for non-gaming PCs or home theater PCs? Well, right now, uh, I'm really liking the integrated graphics built into the Intel's new Sandy Bridge GPUs. Uh, CPUs, I mean. Uh, they're not perfect for things mm -hmm. like Blu-ray. Uh, Robert Heron will note that they don't do 24p perfectly. Most people probably actually wouldn't notice. Right. And I've successfully connected into a Panasonic 3D Plasma, and mm -hmm. they do 3D Blu-ray just fine. Um, so if really, if you want the lowest power solution, you know, get a low power Sandy Bridge. They have 35 watt Sandy Bridge processors mm -hmm. you can get. And uh, put that in there and you can build a real small form factor. If you want to go to discrete GPU, and there may be some reasons you want to do that, right. uh, AMD and, and NVIDIA both make low profile cards that fit mm -hmm. in the small cases. Like the, uh, for NVIDIA, it'd be the 430 uh, GT, or the GT430 as they call it, mm -hmm. and uh, AMD, or GT530, excuse me. And then AMD makes the 5450. They haven't really updated their low end, though, AMD hasn't, which is too bad because they have an excellent video block in the 6000s, but those are still pretty expensive. I'd be nice if the part came down on those. Jake in Utah writes in, with Intel's new Sandy Bridge processors and AMD's Fusion processors, I understand there is a GPU on the same chip as the CPU. Integrated graphics on a motherboard typically is not a good thing. Can you explain why this is a good thing for these two CPUs and what it means? for GPUs or graphics cards in the future? Well, first off, um, all these integrated GPUs, including the ones that are built on the processor die, can be disabled. So mm -hmm. if you stick a PCI Express card, you don't have to worry about not being able to use it. Yeah. Uh, I want to get that a point across. But the, the, the advantage of having the GPU on it, first of all, there's so many more transistors they can put in these, these high-density manufacturing mm -hmm. processes. So they might as well do something with them. So with Intel, they put, Sandy, they put graphics on there. They're basically the same, except they sort of upgraded the DX to DX10.1, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Yeah, because it's not a huge, you're right. not looking at like, you know, the pre-Sandy Bridge, post-Sandy nope. Bridge yeah. going, oh my goodness, I no, can game on it now. they're clocking higher, and so you can sort of game on them if right. you're playing things like The Sims but not if you're doing crisis or something like that. Just the thing right. for a low-res World of Warcraft machine. That's right. Um, now, what Intel did do, they put a really nice video block in it, so mm -hmm. it's, doing, it's great for doing encoding and decoding video. Uh, on the case of Fusion, what you get is a full DX11 part, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it even has in, uh, AMD's latest UVD3 video decoding and encode block in it. It does full DX11. Not real fast, but mm -hmm. fast enough at, say, low-res monitors, 1440 by 900 or something like that, for, and medium detail. But, <laughs> and you know there's a but, AMD CPUs aren't as good as Intel, so you right. get the trade-off there. So. so better graphics on the on the Fusion, yeah. worse graphics, better right. CPU performance from Intel. Right, and, uh, and, and but you can, like I said, drop in a right. PCI Express card in both those solutions and get better graphics. Performance. Are we still running into a lot of cases where low-end motherboards, where they've got like a Sandy Bridge i3, would not have a PCI Express slot? Because that used to be the problem with it. No, I, I have I have not seen even a, um, uh, even it's interesting. Even these mini ITX boards now mm -hmm. are coming with one PCI Express slot. Simon Wright. It's in, hey guys, would you be interested in talking about the Virtu Dynamic GPU? I've attached some links. This might be a really big thing as it promises ultra silent, power efficient, hardcore gaming home theater PCs. Many of us have been looking for such a technology in desktop computers for years, and it seems it's finally coming true. Greets, Simon. So, Lucid Logic promises to virtualize GPU tasks on Sandy Bridge using the onboard GPU for basic stuff with the discrete GPU shut down, then firing it up when, say, you need to get your 3D gaming on. Is that really different? from NVIDIA's Optimus stuff that well, Alienware Well, been first using? of all, Optimus really is only on the laptops right now, right? Okay. So what well, Optimus the does... the M11X, you know. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it's a laptop. But, and, you know, what it does is it allows you to run the discrete GPU for mm -hmm. gaming and then go to the low-power integrated GPU for non-gaming stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Desktop stuff. 
Um, the latest version that they've recently announced, what they do, they have this virtualization technology. So the problem with Sandy Bridge is that if you put a discrete GPU in your system, you can't use the integrated GPU at all. Oh, it's turned off. Why? Uh, that's Intel's Ask chipset Intel. design. <laughs> yes, Ask Intel. Uh, they're aware of the problem. They're talking about maybe fixing it the next generation chipsets, but right now that's the way it is. And so Lucid Logic adds this little chip mm -hmm. that goes on motherboards. Uh, I think the only companies that are going to be offering those right now that I've heard of are MSI. Um, and what they do is they allow the integrated graphics to run when you're just doing standard stuff or doing video, mm -hmm. and then the discrete graphics to run when you want your game on. Um, so I haven't seen it in action yet. It's just mm -hmm. been announced. It'll be interesting to see the reviews. Uh, it's a lovely theory. It's a lovely theory, and we'll have to see how well they execute on it. Always we wait. Jeb's looking to save energy and says, Patrick and Lloyd talked GPU power consumption recently, and I realized my home theater PC's 8800 GTS wastes a lot of electricity. And Antec says my card idles at 170 watts. I believe that this costs me around 108 bucks a year, 15 cents per kilowatt hour, 12 hours a day of use. Is my math right? This machine was for gaming, but now it only does home theater PC duty. I have to jettison that card. How low can I go? My new card doesn't have to be quiet, low profile, or even cheap. I just want the greenest card I can get for my home theater PC. Any advice? Jeb in Washington, D.C. Your math is right. I love cornhusker-power.com's walkthrough on this. It's basically wattage divided by a thousand times the number of hours times your monthly operating cost, your kilowatt hour to get your monthly operating cost. It's good. Yeah, math is good. Well, I'm assuming here that you don't want to replace your motherboard and your CPU, which is sort of the, the what I'm getting from this. Uh, there's a lot of solutions out there. Uh, AMD's uh, Radeon HD 5450 is low power. Uh, I believe that NVIDIA's GeForce GT 530s don't even require a power connector. Mm -hmm. So they're very, and they idle at like a few watts as opposed to 170 watts. <laughs> so you'd save a whole bunch of power if you got one of those cards. So that's sort of what I'd take a look at. It'd probably be quieter too once things get Yes, and some of them are even machine. fanless. I like fanless. Fanless plus home theater PC equals good, unless you're stuffing everything in a closet. Walter's got a classy GPU question. He says, hey, Techzilla, what's more important while gaming, the CPU or the GPU? Some say processor, some say graphics, some say both. I'm hoping you guys can help me get a clear idea on this. Thanks, Walter. I, I say that it depends. I mean, right. I tend to lean towards the both category if you build a balanced system. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, all games are getting more visual in nature. Even a turn-based strategy game that's heavily CPU intensive, mm -hmm. like Civilization V, now supports DX11 graphics and has neat eye candy in it, right? right? So they're both kind of important, and it really depends on what your gaming style is. Are you kind of guy that really needs to crank up every single like graphics slider? You'll probably <laughs> want a bit beefier graphics card, but you're still going to need a good CPU in, in case to do the AI and the physics and stuff like that. I think, can it also make a big difference, like how big your monitor is? You know, yes, <laughs> resolution counts, right? So if you have a modest monitor that runs at 1440 by 900 or 1680 by 1050, like a lot of the old 22-inch mm -hmm. monitors run at, you probably won't need the highest-end graphics card. It would be a complete waste. Right. Uh, even if you crank up all that eye candy, right? right. Get a, get a mid-range card. Uh, if you've got one of those 30-inch panels, you may need two graphics cards. <laughs> so you know, it depends on what you're driving to. It's always amazing to look at the, the graphics charts where you see like, you know, f you know, a cheap card, a, a middle-of-the-range card, and a high-end card, and they kind of flatline between the middle of the range and the high end. If right. something's actually CPU constrained, yep. It a lot depends on how efficient the game engine is. For example, I'm playing Mass Effect again. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. 2560 by 1600, all the eye candy cranked up. I've got one HD 6970 in there. It's doing fine. Right. Uh, Metro 2033, which is this Russian game that's a first-person shooter, it is amazing dog of an engine in the sense that it just eats up everything, right. graphics, CPU, everything you can throw at it. It's sort of the new crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and so you want as much as you can in both categories of that one. Well, generally speaking, though, balance system is the way to go. Yeah, balance your system. And that, as you noted, includes the display as well. Is it still a good rule of thumb to, to basically your GPU should cost about as much as your CPU? These days, that's probably still true, but bear in mind now that, that you know, you can get something like a, the, one of the new Core i5 2500Ks now costs like $200. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, like I said, the Radeon HD 6870 just dropped about $200. So There you go. Yeah. Parody. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, awesome, amazing information as always. What's coming up from you on the writing front? Uh, I've got, I just did a home theater PC project using Sandy Bridge for PC World that'll run next month, I believe. And I just did a couple of those GeForce uh, 560 Ti cards for Maximum PC. When's that one going to hit the street? Those are already on the website. Cool. So if you want to see how that pull-up performs against some of the older cards, then go check it out. 
fastest way to get to Lloyd's work, improbableinsights.com is the website. Lloyd Case people. Lloyd, awesome stuff as always. Thanks a lot. Coming up next, viewer questions. Right now, though, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Jack Threads. We all know most guys hate shopping for clothes. Look at me. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? you got to leave the house, go to the store, look all over the place, find one or two things that are cool. If you're lucky, they even fit, if they even have it the right size. That era, done. Now there's Jack Threads. It's a members-only online shopping club that does the dirty work for you and saves you a boatload of cash. Everyday Jack Threads serves up the hottest new indie brands at huge discount prices like 80% off what you'd pay in the store. Stuff like Kid Robot, The Hundreds, and American Apparel for way less than you'll find it anywhere else. Now, Jack Threads is a private club, but Techzilla's got the hookup for you. To get access to these awesome deals, do yourself a favor, go to jackthreads.com slash T-E-K, and you'll get to skip the wait list and become a member right away. Oh, and do we mention that it's free to join? jackthreads.com slash T-E-K, and you will instantly start saving up to 80% on clothes without even having to leave the house. Tracy from Anna, Texas, wrote us in response to last week's mention of the password management program, KeePass. That's K-E-E. P-A-S-S, -S, by the way. Quote, I've been using KeePass for three years now, but lately it just got great. Here's how I use KeePass wherever I'm at. First, KeePass is cross-platform, Windows, Mac, and yes, Linux, my OS of choice. Since KeePass keeps its data in an encrypted database file, I keep it synced via Dropbox on all my PCs. That's a great idea. Also, there's a KeePass app for the Android OS for free and an iKeePass app for the iOS platform for 99 cents. So install Dropbox on your phone and keep your password synced on the go also. This is by far the best way to keep your strong passwords with you everywhere you go or need them. I love that. I've been wanting to sync my KeePass in info in this fashion, and if I can access my passwords easily via my phone, all the better. I just want to show a big thank you to Tracy for bringing that up. I think it's, uh, it's what I'm doing tonight. I just want to remind everybody also to put the whole self-erase thing in your phone. Um, oh, yeah. Password protect your phone and have it oh, kill yeah. itself. Have the remote, its remote go away yeah. function. <laughs> it's like, I'll know where the phone is and then I'll wipe it clean. Yeah, but, nothing, nothing worse than realizing you're giving someone access to your corporate network and your bank and your eBay account because you lost your phone. I will say I did a quick look on the iOS platform and there are two programs related to KeePass that, and one of them, the, the iKeePass program was actually fairly low rated compared to the other one. I'd say the other one's easier to use, but I have a question of just how secure these programs are. Are they really coming from the actual writers of the original software? Right. I just, I have to be certain of that before I actually am gonna just hand over <laughs> passwords to some rogue program on my phone. Yeah. Rogue as in, I just haven't thoroughly investigated it You'd yet. hate to find out it was an enormous social engineering oh, activity. <laughs> I would be so boned. And look, here at DEF CON 2011, we have Robert Heron's personal email account. I have enough friends in, in security of many kinds to where I would never live this down, so. Yeah, that, that's why I'm on. always entering in my <laughs> My, my ATM card code like this, because if I ever get my ATM hacked, my friends will mock me forever. Yeah. Brandon from Wisconsin wrote in asking, well, about screen tearing. Since I experienced screen tearing mostly when I'm playing on the PS3, even more so on the Xbox 360, and occasionally while watching TV through my satellite box. Will a video processor such as the DVD -O Edge do anything for this, or is it all caused by the GPUs in the individual systems? Brandon in Wisconsin. Interesting. That Tearing, it's a graphical anomaly that right. you'll see in the picture. It's usually a symptom of the graphic system output not syncing with the display's refresh rate, meaning that, like in PC, this is where I'm most familiar with right. this on the PC side of things, you let your computer just basically spit frames out as fast as possible, usually when you're gaming. At a higher refresh rate than your monitor. And say the monitor, handle. most LCDs operate at 60 hertz, right. and it's best to keep those synced so you don't actually have, like, you'll see it as a line across the screen where the graphics just don't line up for a split second, and then it refreshes and continues on. But I find it absolutely annoying, and I always enable what they call vertical sync or V-sync. Right. But it, you should... I'm trying to determine why you would see that in TV programming. You should never see that coming from your Dish Network, your DirecTV, your cable box, your yeah. Blu-ray player, or for that matter, your Xbox 360 or your PS3. Because all of these devices were designed to output at a standard, basically, like 60 hertz, 1080p or 720p or whatever the resolution yeah. is to your HDTV. There is no reason you should ever have any dis any device designed to, out to, to basically exclusively output to a TV should not ever experience tearing, which makes me wonder, is there a problem in the firmware on the monitor he or she is I, using? I'd also check the cables. I'd, be, I'd need more information. How is everything being routed to right. the TV? Uh, are, is there an AVR in the mix somewhere? Right. Is there, how's the cabling set up? 
I try to go through all that, and then I then I'd go to each console and just make sure it's you're, you're sending the display device the maximum resolution it supports right. from all of your devices. So your game consoles, if they support 1080p 60 output, do that. Same with your Blu-ray players. The TV, make sure it is either in a native mode for right. whatever content it's receiving, or you've got it set to whatever the maximum resolution for your particular display device. In most cases, you just leave the cable or satellite box set to 1080i output, unless it offers a native mode and you can and you know how to work that. I would almost say if you haven't had your television professionally calibrated, reset your you know one. Make sure if there's any updates available for your HD TV, you have applied them. Two, reset it to the factory specs. Three, basically calibrate your HD TV. We've done a whole bunch of segments on how to do this for practically no money. Four, individually connect your PS3, your Xbox 360, your other devices to the HDMI port on the television or the component. Make sure they are all set up to the maximum output that is compatible with your HD TV. Then, if you if you don't see the tearing, then start adding in your in your other devices, your AVR, anything that might be, or switches, anything that might be between those devices and the HD TV, and hopefully you will eliminate this. Because you shouldn't be having that problem at all. Right. And I don't want you to go out and spending you know four or five hundred dollars on a piece of hardware hoping to fix it when you know it, it just shouldn't, shouldn't be happening in the first place. Yeah. Hey, for everybody watching, we live on your questions. So email us, techzilla at revision3.com, at techzilla, at Robert Heron, at Veronica Belmont, at Patrick Norton. Tech help, product reviews, how to's, you ask us, we'll do it, but we need your emails or your tweets. Your tweets. 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 Smoke signals. Smoke signals. No smoke signals. <laughs> okay, no we smoke signals. We got fog signals. here, smoke signals don't work so That's good. That's true. In the Bay they would area. get lost in the fog. Even better, send us a video question. <laughs> Think of all the fun you can have and all the admiration of your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Please just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla. Or at uh, youtube.com slash techhd. Oh, if you got the YouTube account, we'd love it if you subscribe. Please do channel. so. And thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. It's a 1080p transfer of the original two, uh, 239 to 1. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Picture is a 1080p transfer of the original one, uh, 185 to 1. Why am I having with numbers today? The Criterion Collection's Armacord. Amacord. The Criterion Collection's Armacord. Am. 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 Amacord. Amar. Amarcord. Amma. Amar. Amarcord. <laughs> am. Right? <laughs> Is it am? Amacord? Amarcord. Amarcord. There we go. Jeez.